Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. So Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 42, and the word of the Sovereign Lord reads, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck, and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It would be better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if, it, if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. The late R.C. Sproul once wrote, in the New Testament, love is more um, of a verb than it is a noun. It, is, it has more to do with, with acting than with feeling. The call to love is not so much a call to a certain state of feeling as it is a quality of our action. So as promised this week, we are now come right back to this text of Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 50, and so uh, if you were not here last week, I want to encourage you to listen to that message because um, it is foundational to everything else we're going to talk about for the next couple of weeks because a lot of what we're going to talk about today is connected to what we talked about last week. And the reason for that and the reason why we're looking at this same text now two weeks in a row is because this text right here is really critically important for us to understand with respect to following Jesus. And this text is actually a very difficult text, a difficult passage of Scripture for just about anyone who reads it. And as we talked about last week, this particular text has, has, is difficult for a number of reasons. The first of which is that there's just a lot here in the text. All right, there's a lot of issues being addressed in this passage. In fact, last week we mentioned that this text is about radical discipleship, radical obedience, radical purity, radical sacrifice, radical love, and it's about how Jesus radically rescued us from the curse of hell, which is what we focused on last week. And what we discovered is, is there are just a lot of you know, things to unpack in, pack in this particular text. Secondly, this text is difficult because it's, it's difficult to interpret. I mean, think about it. Jesus talks about millstones being tied to your neck and being drowned in the ocean. Right? And then he talks about hell and plucking out your eyeball and cutting off hands. And then he talks about being salted with fire. Um, and, and so obviously Jesus is using strong language and metaphors and, and hyperbole to make a serious point. And it's important that we certainly seek to understand that point but this is a very complex and difficult text to interpret. Thirdly, this passage is difficult because there are a couple of variant readings in the Greek manuscripts used to translate our Bibles into English. As we talked about last week, there are some differences that have popped up over time, over history, that have led to some, translating, some translations including a repeated verse or phrase that isn't in others. And it's not that this is a huge deal because it doesn't change the overall meaning of the text. It just... It just raises the, the difficulty level a little bit, because what we see is even the scribes themselves over time wrestled with this particular text. And then finally, it's a difficult text because Jesus has brought us face to face with some difficult truths, like the grim reality of hell, right? which is what we talked about last week. Hell is real. It is the just punishment of sin. It's a horrible place of eternal torment. And this is the reality, right? That, that, that should shake us up. This reality of hell should, should cause us to sit up and take it seriously. And it should also cause us to grieve because every single day there are people who step off into eternity unprepared to meet God. And because they're unprepared, because of their unbelief, they're being cast into hell. The reality of hell should stir us up and drive us to share the hope of Christ with everyone around us. But it should also cause us to worship God. Because in the end, God's justice will be done. And those who have committed atrocities in this world will be judged by God. And those who have escaped justice here in this life will likewise be judged by God. 
And we worship him for that. His justice will be done because justice is good. But this should also cause us to worship because we have been saved from the reality of hell. Those who are in Christ have been spared the, the eternal torment of hell. Because Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, sacrificed himself on the cross as payment for our sins so that we could be radically rescued from hell. And more than that, he gives us his righteousness so now we can spend eternity in the life-giving presence of God the Father forever. And, and that's not all. We also discovered the truth that the, the, this truth about hell, is, you know, this horrific reality about hell, as Jesus talks about in this text, is the thing that makes everything else that we talk about make sense. Right? It's the reason why Jesus coming into the world and becoming a man makes sense. It's the reason why Jesus being sacrificed on the cross makes sense. It's the reason why he calls us to follow him, right? And, and the reason why he calls us to radical discipleship, why that makes sense. It all makes sense in light of how we've been radically saved by Christ from hell. And in light of this, we understand that we, who are saved by Christ, are called to live radically different than the rest of the world. Discipleship, right, is living out the radical transformation of our hearts, right, um, because we've been res radically rescued by God. Life in the kingdom is supposed to be radically different than the world. Because we have been saved and supernaturally changed by God himself. Which means following Christ is about what Jesus says that it is. And he says following him is about living a life of self-denial. He says, if you're going to follow me, you need to not deny yourself. It's about selflessness. It means, he said, that those who are going to be great in the kingdom needs to be... The, the least and the, and the servant of all. Life is also about, self, uh, about sacrifice. Jesus said, deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. We need to be willing to pay whatever price it takes to go where Christ is leading. It's about humility. And it's also about service to others. And this is the radical change in lifestyle that we're called to. And on the outside, it might seem impossible until you understand what Christ has done to set you free. Jesus radically rescued from the eternal torment of hell all on his own. He lived a life that you couldn't live. He obeyed the law that you couldn't obey. He died on a cross to pay a penalty you couldn't pay. He endured the wrath of God you couldn't endure. And he then gives you a righteousness you don't deserve. All that to save you. Jesus paid it all. And if that were not enough, he offers you the free gift of eternal life and heaven as a reward, not by you working for it and not by you being religious and performing religious rituals. He offers it to you simply through faith and repentance. If you would repent and believe in him, if you would repent and believe the gospel, you will be saved. That's the promise. And God the Holy Spirit, as we have seen, radically transforms our hearts so that we would hear and so that we would understand that truth and believe and receive that gift. And again, if that weren't enough, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and he supernaturally enables us to live out this radical discipleship. And what we see is God's call, that God's work in our lives, this radical discipleship isn't quite so radical right, in light of what Christ has done for us then. Our changed hearts, he, he rescuing us from hell, and, and the empowerment that, that he gives us to follow him, following Christ in this context doesn't seem quite so radical then. But it is radical to the rest of the world. It's radical to all those around us. And that's why Jesus uses such strong language here. In fact, turn with me again to um, Mark 9, and we're going to look at verse 42 really closely. Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. I don't know about you, but when I read this, this verse makes my heart sink a little bit. Because this is absolutely a stern and graphic warning from the mouth of our Lord. This is from the mouth of Christ himself. Right? These are, are his own words. And this should be especially disconcerting to those who have built for themselves a view of Jesus 
that is always meek and is always mild and, and never wants to hurt anybody's feelings and is always soft and gentle and unassuming and always is so understanding and patient is never forceful. Right? This picture of Jesus that never raises his voice and never condemns anyone and never wants anyone to feel uncomfortable. You know what I'm talking about. This is the Jesus everybody appeals to when Christians stand firm and speak the truth to the world. Whenever we speak the truth about things like abortion, or same-sex marriage, or adultery, or the fact that God has created mankind, male and female, from the beginning, and that doesn't change. Whenever Christians speak the truth about these things, the world appeals to this hyper-emotional, ultra-sensitive Jesus who only wants people to be happy and never wants anybody to feel the weight of their sin. That Jesus doesn't exist, by the way. Yes, Jesus is loving and compassionate and gracious and merciful. We have seen that throughout the scriptures. But he also is brutally honest about the truth. He speaks the truth about hell. And he said that if you cause one of these little ones to sin, it would be better if you had a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea. That's what Jesus himself said. This is a graphic, in-your-face kind of warning. And, and, to, and, to make, and make no mistake, the disciples, when they heard what Jesus said, they knew exactly what he was talking about here. You see... This might be a strange expression to us in our culture, but this is not an unfamiliar uh, metaphor to them in this context. In fact, this punishment was something that they were super familiar with. In fact, do me a favor, since it's almost Christmas time, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. It's a little bit to the right. Luke chapter 2. Again, this is almost Christmas time, and I think this is a part of the scriptures we're going to be familiar with. But Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and it reads this. And in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. Now, this is something we're very familiar with. This is a text that we are very familiar with because this census was the catalyst, as you know, for Joseph to take his wife, or his soon-to-be wife, Mary, who was now pregnant with Jesus, to his family's historical home of Bethlehem. They, they resided somewhere else, and they moved, and they, they went to Bethlehem for this purpose, and that's why Jesus ended up being born in Bethlehem. It says in verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no, fir- no place for them in the inn. Now what you need to realize is that there's more to this story. You see, the purpose of the census was not simply so that the Roman Empire could count everybody and know how many people were in, this, in, in the empire. It was to identify everyone so that everybody would pay their taxes. This was a way of controlling who was in the empire so that the, the empire would know who was paying their taxes and who wasn't paying their This is about taxation. And what you need to understand is not everyone willingly complied with this command from the empire. The emperor, right? Just the same way, even in our country, they'll pass a law and we'll have people who, who, will, who will obey, some people who will begrudgingly obey, and some people say, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight back against it. I'm going to push back against that. Right? And, and that's what we see here. Right? There, there, were, there were a lot of Jewish people in this time who refused to, to, to be counted in the census and to pay taxes. In fact, there was a man named Judas of Galilee who, who led a resistance to this census. And he encouraged Jews not to register. Right? And those who did, he had their houses burnt down and their cattle stolen by his followers. He was very zealous against standing against the Roman government. This census led to another violent uprising against the Roman government by this man Judas and his followers. 
Now, what we know about the Roman, Romans is they just don't sit back and wait for things to happen. They respond. And they respond with the, to these things with an iron fist. And whenever the Romans would capture rebels, they didn't just simply kill them and leave them in a ditch. They would make, they would make an example out of them. They would publicly execute these people in horrific ways and make examples out of them. And one of the ways that we're very familiar with is crucifixion. The Romans would simply crucify rebels to make an example out of them. In fact, there was a point where there were streets that would be lined on both sides with, with people who were dying on crosses so that everybody would see, this is what the Romans will do to you if you get out of line. But that's not the only way that they would execute people. Another way which is less familiar to us, is what Jesus describes here. Many of the followers of Judas of Galilee, because of their proximity to the Sea of Galilee, had stones tied around their necks, and they were dropped in the deep part of the lake and drowned. This was a horrific way to die. But it wasn't just horrific because of the death. It was horrific because of the imagery left behind was horrifying. The idea of being dropped into the darkness of the deep, you know, of the uh, of this lake, tied to a rock, and then left there for your lifeless body to be permanently floating there in the darkness of the abyss, slowly decomposing, is horrifying to a culture that values and esteems the bodies of the dead. At least with the crucifixion, you can have your body taken down and your family can then, then properly dispose of, of your body and treat it the right way. Right? But those who are tethered to a rock in the bottom of the lake, not only they're executed, but then they're left there to basically rot forever. And this all happened right there around the birth of Christ. And this is a historical event that all of them would have been familiar with. Why? Because they're fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. They would have heard this story a hundred times, and they would have told this story hundreds of times. And this image would have been etched in their minds. And if you remember, when Jesus was walking on the water, what did they think? They think they saw a ghost. Probably supposing it was one of those people tethered who, who was resurrected out of the deep. Right? And that's why Jesus uses this image here. He's not making something up. He's leveraging the fear and the, the horror of this historical event to drive home a point. And this imagery that Jesus uses here is the part that opens up this text, right? which means this is not just a passing comment. This is a very stern warning, a warning that we should pay attention to. We need to make sure to be diligent to understand fully what Jesus is communicating. Jesus said it's better for someone to suffer the horror of being drowned in the Sea of Galilee like rebels against the Roman government rather than being someone who causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin. It's better, he said. It's better to suffer the death of a criminal than to cause one of these who believe in me to sin. Sink in. It's better, he said. In fact, the word better here from the Greek actually doesn't just simply mean preferable. It actually means it's more virtuous. It's actually more honorable. It is more beautiful. Right? It's how it can be translated. To be executed in this manner than to cause one of these little ones to sin. (laughs) Just think about that for a second. This expression, as strange as it may seem to us, should grab our attention and cause us to look very closely and take this seriously. But the problem is many of us don't take it seriously. And the reason why is is this is a text that many people will read, and we'll just read through it. And and we'll never think about the historical and cultural and textual context behind what he's saying. And the result is that I've heard many people say, well, what, what this means is anyone who causes a child who believes in Jesus to sin, that person will be severely punished. Right? And then the application then is we better be careful not to cause children to fall into sin. I've heard that multiple times in my Christian life. That's what people say that, this, that Jesus is saying. But let me assure you, that is not even close to the, to the point of this text. Now, I agree that we shouldn't cause children to sin. Right? But that is not the point that Jesus is making here. And, and here is why. The words, little ones, in the Greek 
right, do not mean child. The word that gets translated little ones, it does not mean child. It's never translated as child, ever. Now, it can certainly mean someone that's small in stature, and it can certainly mean someone young in age, but the most likely meaning of this word is the least ones, or the least of value. Remember that in the first century, all of their society was divided according to a social value system. People were were divided from the most important all the way down to the least important. And in the context of this story, what has Jesus been talking about all along? The least in the kingdom. Remember the conversation began with, with Jesus confronting the apostles who were arguing about who would be the greatest in all the kingdom. And Jesus said the greatest would be the least in the kingdom. And the greatest would be the servant of all. And then, he, and then he pulls a child to himself and says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me uh, re- receives not me, but him who sent me. And the point that he was making is not that he, he loved tra- children so much. Well, he did, but that's not the point he was making. The point he was making is since children in that culture were seen as the least important people in all of society, what Jesus was saying is the least important person in the kingdom has great value to God. And to value them and to love them was the same thing as valuing and loving God. And to disdain them and to hate them was to disdain and hate God himself. Right? And then right after that he says, Truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Or in other words, the very least and insignificant kind of service given to God and his followers, even by the most insignificant person in the world, has great value to God. You see, the whole section that we're in is, has been about Jesus telling disciples Right? That greatness in the kingdom is not about your position. It is not about your prestige. It's not about your titles or political power or your skills or your abilities or who you're connected to. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is about valuing and loving and serving and appreciating the contributions of the very least valued person in the entire world. Jesus is telling them that the value system of the kingdom of heaven is completely upside down compared to the rest of the world. The rest of the world values you because of beauty. They value you because of your money. They value you because of what you can give to them. They value you because of your talents. They value you because of your political connections. They value you for all that you can bring. But remember, life in the kingdom is radically different than the rest of the world. And Jesus is saying the least important people, according to the word, the world standard, are supremely important in the kingdom of God. And if the apostles truly wanted to be great, then they needed to humble themselves and value and love even the lowest of the low. That's the context. Right? Right. Jesus is placing a high value on the least person in the kingdom. And so when Jesus says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, what he's, he, he's, he is talking about those who are considered to be the least people in the entire kingdom. The least powerful. The least influential the least mature, the least educated, the least connected, those with the least resources, the ones that are easy to overlook, the ones who are easy to ignore. And I want you to notice the qualifier here. He's not just talking about all people in general. These little ones or the least ones are the ones who believe in him. That's what he says. These little ones who believe in me. You see, Jesus is talking about believers, People who put their trust in him. People who have repented and believed the gospel. You see, these are not just people. These are not just some unimportant people in the world. These are all brothers and sisters in Christ. They are family. They are believers. All of whom, all of whom, even the least of them, are supremely important to God. And so what Jesus is saying is if anyone causes these believers, as insignificant as they may seem to us, to sin, it would be better, it would be more honorable to be a criminal who's drowned in the sea. You see, Jesus is driving home the importance of every believer. 
of every believer. And if I didn't make that point emphatic enough, every believer, even those who seem to be insignificant to everyone else, this is a truth that the church needs to come to terms with. This is a truth that needs to be etched deep into our hearts. This must be a truth that defines who we are. Every believer, every believer has great value in the kingdom of God. Every believer is important, including the ones that you love and including the ones that you can't stand. Every believer has great value in the kingdom of heaven. Now, as important as that is, we're still not all the way there yet, though. Because the second thing that you need to understand is the phrase where he says, one who causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. This phrase in English actually does not fully communicate the depth of what Jesus is really trying to get across to us. Because the phrase, cause to sin... Right, that entire phrase is only one Greek word, right? And it's this Greek word right here, and it's pr- pronounced "skandalizo." I don't know how you pronounce it by looking at that that way, but that's what it says, "skandalizo," which is the word we get in, in English for our word to scandalize, or the word for scandal. And, and it certainly would mean. To cause someone to sin, that certainly is within the, within the range of meaning, but it really means more. Right? Right? In fact, the better way to translate this would be to cause someone to stumble. That's a better translation. It's a more literal translation. This is the emphasis of the word, causing someone to stumble or get tripped up or cause someone to fall. And so the emphasis is more, it's so much bigger than just causing someone to sin. It's causing someone to stumble in their faith. It's causing someone to fall. It means to be a stumbling block. You see, what Jesus is saying here is if anyone causes one of these believers, no matter how worthless they may seem to you, to stumble, it would be better for your lifeless body to be hanging motionless in the dark of the sea attached to some rock. It would be a more honorable fate for you. Jesus is giving a stern warning about causing others to stumble. But understand, Jesus is not just simply trying to scare us here. He's using graphic language and a graphic illustration to drive home an important point. And the point is, our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who believe in him, all of them, all of them are supremely important to him. And because they are supremely important to to him, they ought be important to us. That's the point he's making. Even the least ones. They ought to be important to us. It doesn't matter if they're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if they're famous or the nameless, faceless ones, like the man who was casting out demons. They wouldn't even say his name because he wasn't important. It doesn't matter if they have strong leadership skills or the best that they can offer is to wash somebody's feet. It doesn't matter if they're, if they're beautiful and easy to be around or if they're dirty and downright ugly. It doesn't matter if they have all the pieces of their life together and, and they're organized or if their life and their daily routine is just chaotic. It doesn't matter if they're easy to be around or they annoy the daylights <laughs> out of you. Hear me. All believers, all our brothers and sisters in Christ... Even the least important, most insignificant, most obnoxious, most annoying ones, all of them are supremely important to God and they should be supremely important to us. That is the point. You see, what Jesus is saying is discipleship and following him is about radical love. That's been the driving point of this entire conversation since it started. It's about radical love. A radical love for God and a radical love for all believers. All other believers, even the least of them. Why? Because we all have been radically rescued. right? We have been radically rescued. And because, we have, because of that, we have also had our hearts radically changed by God. And because of that, we have been called to live radically different lives than the rest of the world. All of us. Life in the kingdom is about us having a radical love for God. And having a radical love for what God loves. And do you know what God loves? He loves all those who believe in him. Hence the story of the shepherd leaving 
the 99 to go get the one. Even the least important ones, even the most insignificant ones. And this radical love then should cause us, it should drive us to be watchful and mindful of our lives so that we might not cause any one of God's children to stumble. It should cause us to be aware of of our influence on other people. It should cause us to be aware that our actions and our attitudes have consequences, not just for us, but for others around us. Because every one of us has the potential to impact other believers, whether for good or for bad. And Jesus makes it clear that we're not to be stumbling blocks for our brothers and sisters in Christ. What does it mean to be a stumbling block? I mean, how do we cause people to stumble? Well, the, well, the easy answer is, is when we cause someone to sin. That's the easy one. That's the, the one that's right out in front. We need to be careful not to cause someone else to fall into sin. It's that simple. For example, the Bible says, the Bible does not prohibit the drinking of alcohol. You cannot make that case. I don't care who you are. You cannot go to the text and make that case. That, that the Bible says, thou shalt not ever drink alcohol. It doesn't say that. But it does make a prohibition against being drunk. And so as a Christian, you have the freedom to enjoy a glass of wine or a beer with your dinner. Just don't get drunk. right? But you need to be careful, though, in the context that you do so, because there may be brothers and sisters in Christ who struggle with drunkenness, and you exercising your freedom, drinking around them, might bring too much temptation for them to be able to handle, causing them to fall. You don't want to be the cause of someone else's sin. That, by the way, is also why we talk about modesty. This is something that really offends a lot of people. And, I, and believe me, I believe that people should be personally responsible for their own actions, and they are, they're personally responsible for their own thought life. But as believers in Christ, I think we should be conscious of how maybe our appearance might affect other people. Right? And, and with that, I mean, I think that loving our brothers and sisters in Christ should cause us to at least think about modesty. We don't want to cause others to sin. Now, there's lots of other ways to cause people to sin. Everything from, from temptation to condoning sinful lifestyles. In fact, that's probably the biggest one that most people engage in is for some reason we want to say praise the Lord and you know, the, the Bible is true, but then when it comes to the people that we care about and love, when they, when they start delving off into sin, whether it's living with someone right, or, or, or premarital sex or whatever, we, we want to say, well, it's not, a, it's not a big deal. We want to just kind of encourage that. And what we're doing is we're causing them because we're approving of their sin. Causing people to, to stumble is about causing them to sin, but it's not just that. It's also about causing them to doubt. Now, God, please understand, God does not get offended when a believer struggles with doubt, because we all are going to struggle with that at some point. God is bigger than our doubts, and God can certainly you know, carry us through our doubts. But you and I don't want to be the cause of someone's doubts. We don't want to cause someone to doubt God. We don't want to cause them to doubt his love. We don't want to cause someone to doubt his goodness. We don't want to be the cause of them doubting his faithfulness. We don't want our actions and how we live and our attitudes and how we might treat them be the reason why our brothers and sisters doubt God. We should be the influence that strengthens their faith, not the influence that weakens it. And we certainly don't want to be the cause of them to fall away. We don't want our actions and our attitudes toward them or in front of them be the reason why, we, why they walk away from, from Christ in the first place. And brothers and sisters, it happens. Right? That's, that's something that I think we're familiar with. In our country, one of the prominent reasons that many people have left the Christian faith in America is because someone or a group of someones in the church have hurt them or disappointed them. Someone in the church has wounded them. Everything from abuse to moral failures of church leadership to discrimination a great number of people who have walked away from, from Jesus, they've done so because of people in the church. And I'm sure you've, you've heard this before. Oftentimes people will fall away, not because of what the Bible, they're struggling with what the, the truths of the Bible, but they're, they're struggling with the behavior of those in the body of Christ. We don't ever want to be the cause of someone falling away. And we won't be the cause of them leaving the fellowship either. And this is very, very, very common in the world. There are people who just who were saved. There are people who love the Lord, but simply have gotten unplugged from the body of Christ because someone in the body has hurt them or mistreated them or ignored them. 
There are people who love Jesus, who trust in him, who, who simply just don't want to be let down anymore or hurt anymore, and they just simply stop coming to church. Now, I understand I will always preach that every person should take responsibility for their own walk with God. Right? Every person should take responsibility to get plugged in. Right? But we, as our brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't want to be the reason for them to leave. We don't want to be the cause of someone being stunted in their spiritual growth. The fact is, sometimes we bear some responsibility in that. We don't want to be the cause of anyone leaving the fellowship or following away from the faith, or doubting God, or falling into sin. We don't want to do anything, anything that would compromise the faith of another. In fact, Kent Hughes defines causing someone to stumble that way. He says, anything that we do that compromises the faith of another, right? anything in the way that we live, in the way that we behave, in the way that we talk, in the way that we minister, in the way that we treat others, anything we do can, that can compromise the faith of another is something that we should seek to avoid. Again, Jesus makes it clear, especially the mature believers have a huge responsibility to live and walk in this radical love and not cause our brothers and sisters in Christ to stumble. Jesus takes this very, very seriously. And he's saying that this is what it means to follow him. To walk in this radical kind of love. We must love God enough and love his children enough to be mindful of how we live as not to be the reason they stumble. Church, we need to love each other enough not to cause one another to stumble. So what what does that mean? Does that mean we have to be perfect and never live lives where we never make any mistakes at all? Does that mean that we need to always be happy and joyful all the time, saying praise the Lord and hallelujah all the time? Does that mean that we need to, to allow people to walk all over us? Does that mean that we need to, 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 to never be able to say no when somebody wants something from us? Is that what Jesus is saying here? No, it's not what he's saying here. In fact, it's not even close. What he's saying is we need to avoid doing things that cause people to stumble. And those things can be summed up in really four very clear categories. And the first one I think is the easiest one to identify it's, it's false teaching. Because if there's anything that can cause someone to stumble really, really quick, it's going to be that. False teaching. False teaching is dangerous because it can lead people into grievous sin. It can cause people to doubt. It can cause people to leave the church. And it can certainly cause people to fall completely away. That's why we talk about things like the prosperity gospel here. The prosperity gospel is a false teaching that leads people away from God because because you begin to place your value on material things and possessions and your own desires over Christ. It's horribly destructive. The prosperity gospel is a huge stumbling block that causes people to fall in our country. And anyone who teaches that should be rebuked, and anyone who believes it should be corrected. And the same can be said for easy believism and moralistic therapeutic deism and even legalism, trying to earn your way into heaven. And, the, and even the idea that, that, that God has, has changed his mind somehow and has accepted deviant lifestyles. False teaching is horribly dangerous, and it, and it causes people to stumble all over the world. That is why the Bible has so much to say, by the way, of false teachers and false teaching. In fact, every New Testament book, when you read it, you will find that just about every New Testament book talks about false teaching one way or the other. This is a warning for us. Understand, this is not just a warning for pastors, though. Obviously, the the greatest source of false teaching can be the pulpit. But this is a warning for the, the body of Christ as well, because false teaching can come from within the body. False teaching, teachers can spring up anywhere. We have a responsibility to share the gospel, all of us. We have the responsibility also to make sure that what we teach is based on sound doctrine. In fact, someone in our Bible study mentioned that they knew someone who who they believed to be an Orthodox believer in Christ, and this person was not this person was just simply a layman in their church, and and they decided to start their own church. And this person has a very dynamic and charismatic personality, and and people are drawn to him, and he's drawing others away from, from biblical churches. And this man's a false teacher because he denies flatly the Trinity, and he's getting other people to do the same thing. 
He denies the foundational nature of God himself, his triune nature. This man is not a believer at all. He's a classic false teacher, and he's leading people to hell. This, by the way, is also why we have pastors in, or, or elders in the church. The church, according to the word of God, is to be led by biblically qualified men you know, called elders or pastors, and these men are to absolutely meet the required moral standards set forth in 1 Timothy um, and Titus. And they must be men who are grounded in orthodox historical Christian faith, and they must be able to teach sound doctrine. The church is to be led by, by theolog- be led theologically, not by a committee, and, and, and not by laymen, and not by deacons. The church is to be led doctrinally, theologically led, by those who have been trained up and qualified to lead, and have demonstrated that God has called them to the office of elder or pastor. And biblically speaking, churches really shouldn't be led by only one pastor or elder, because there's still room for error. But biblical model is for each church to be led by a plurality of Elders, a group of men who have been called and trained and ordained to preach and teach and lead the congregation, theologically speaking. These group of men who can uphold one another and correct each other. And this is something we're going to talk more about in, the next, in, in a few weeks, but the best defense against false teaching is to have a strong church under the leadership of biblical elders and pastors. And so false teaching can lead people astray, but another category a little closer to home is the sin in our own lives. That's another way that we can cause people to stumble. That's why Jesus makes the statement immediately after this statement. And if your hand causes you to sin or stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom with God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus says all of this in the context of discipleship and in the context of valuing and radically loving the very least in the kingdom. Our sin in our lives can be a stumbling block to our brothers and sisters. Again, think about the moral failings of of, of people who've been in leadership in the church. I mean, we, we read about it all the time and how churches completely fall apart. Right? These things hurt people. Or how about when, when we get caught being hypocritical, right? I mean, one of the reasons why people say they won't go to church, one of the reasons why people won't even hear the gospel is why? Because they're all a bunch of hypocrites. We all know that our sin can cause people to, to question our faith. And it can be the reason why someone else stumbles. Now, is this a call for us to be perfect? No. Because we know that it's not even going to happen in the sight of heaven. Right? But it is a call for us to take sin seriously. It's a call for us to take our sin seriously. Our sin has consequences for us, but it also can affect other people, like, like your children, how many children resent their parents because at church, in front of everyone, their parents are all perfect and happy and joyful, but at home, they're, in front of their kids, their sin is on full display. Their sinful attitudes and their behaviors are all on display for the kids to see. Right? In fact, I heard one story uh, where a boy came to his, his uh, pastor and said, Pastor, can you make my mama uh, like she is at church and not at home? <laughs> or how about classmates and coworkers? Does your sin cause them to stumble? I remember talking to a young man in our youth group years ago. He told me that he mentioned, he was actually kind of bragging about this. He told me that he mentioned someone to someone at, at, that, that was working at the school at the time. He said that he told them that he was a Christian. And, and the reply was, wow, I would have never guessed that. His sin was what he was actually known for. How, how many other students turned away from hearing the gospel because of his you know, inconsistent witness. We're never going to know. Our sin can be the stumbling block that blocks others, right? And, and, and we need to take it seriously. In fact, we need, to take, we need to talk more about this next week. In fact, we're going to talk about radical purity and, and radical obedience that God's calling us to. When we see this text, we see that there's a call for us to take our sin seriously. But the truth is, though, for the average Christian, false teaching 
And even the sin in our lives isn't going to be the most common source of us causing someone to stumble. It's, it's not. These things, for the most part, are not going to be the reason why you and I will cause others to sin, for the most part, and to doubt God and to fall away and walk away from the fellowship. I mean, these are certainly issues, believe me, and they're important, that's what we're talking about them, but they're not the greatest issues that you and I have to face. The greatest issues that you and I have to face, where we can cause others to stumble, is actually a little closer to home than that. And before I tell you what they are, I need you to know, I need you to know I love you. I need you to not doubt that. And I need you to know I'm telling you this because I love you. And you simply need to hear it and decide right now to take it to, to heart and to allow the Word of God to penetrate your heart and change you and how you live and interact with, with other believers. We are called not to be a stumbling block for our brothers and sisters in Christ, even the least important ones. And the most common way that we will stumble is in how we will tend to withhold love and withhold forgiveness. Those are the most common ones. Those are the most damaging ones. From those that we, who, who, from those who are our brothers and sisters, right? from those that we don't like, we withhold our love and forgiveness from our brothers and sisters who maybe offend us or hurt our feelings or Rub us the wrong way. And this right here is where we're going to struggle. Because let's face it. If there are people who are believers in Christ, right, there are all kinds of people, right? And, and some of them are a little harder to get along with. There are people who trust in Christ who simply just offend us. There are people who, who are in the family of God that just rub us the wrong way. There are people even sometimes in our own church family, they can hurt us. And our natural response is to become like the world. It's natural. Your natural response is to become cold and aloof and to avoid them and to withhold love and forgiveness. And we'll try to justify it saying, well, at least I'm not being mean to them. You know, at least I didn't punch them in the face. At least I'm not being nasty. At least I'm not being hurtful and hateful to them. But you will still withhold love and forgiveness from them. And this can be a huge stumbling block for others around you. Others who maybe not even be related to the incident, they're watching you model the behavior. Because they hear us talk about what we believe and they see that we're living in a contrary way to what we say we believe. And they hear us talk about the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, but then they don't see any of that coming from us. And whether we like it or not, the least important Christian to us is supremely important to God. And as such, we have no right. We have no right to withhold love and forgiveness from any one of them. But this is the area of greatest struggle for most Christians. Right? But here's the thing. The Word of God calls us out and demands that we grow past this. I want you to hear the words of John in 1 John. Chapter 4, verse 19, he says... We love because we, he first loved us. Right? We love because he first loved us. And then he says, if anyone love, says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must, love, must also love his brother. And, and, and the commandment that John is talking about, that he's referencing here, is, is what he recorded Jesus saying in the Gospel of, of John in chapter 13. Just after washing his disciples' feet, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, the way you love one another, is, is how all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So the commandment is, is absolutely clear. Right? I mean, we already know it's been established by the law that we need to love our neighbors, which basically includes everyone around us. And then Jesus even went a step further and said we need to love our enemies. But then Jesus makes it clear that fellow believers are not just, we're not just to love each other, we're to love each other the way that Christ loved us. 
How did he love us? He loved us sacrificially because he died for us. He loved us selflessly because he gave himself up for us. He loved us unconditionally. Even though we were completely unlovable, he loved us anyway. Anyway. That's the standard, that we're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, even the least of them, the way that Christ loved us. We have no cause. We have no right to withhold love for those who trust in Jesus, no matter how unimportant they may seem, and no matter how important and entitled we may feel. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to be best friends, though. It doesn't mean that we have to hang out all the time and, and go to lunch. Right? But it does mean that we need to allow, not allow our personalities and our emotions to get in the way that causes other people to stumble. We are to love with a radical, supernatural, God-given love, which means that we need to forgive too. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. How? As God in Christ forgave you. Just in case you don't think he was making a point. In Colossians he says, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. And then he says, So you also must forgive. Even Jesus makes this point. Matthew chapter 18, we read, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Which is 490 times, but that's not the point he was making. The point he was making is you just need to forgive and keep forgiving. Church family, we have no cause to, to withhold forgiveness. We have no right why? It's the gospel. We've been forgiven for much worse. Remember Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of the living God, he didn't right, get dropped into a lake where he was just quickly snuffed out. He suffered much worse. He went to the cross and he suffered the awful and terrible wrath of God the Father. He drank down the full cup of God's wrath to pay the penalty for your sins so that you could be forgiven. That's what we have to begin with. That's our understanding. You should forgive because you've been forgiven. You should love because you have been loved by God through Christ, even though that you didn't deserve to be loved by God. We have no cause to withhold love or forgiveness from anyone of our brethren, even the least among us, because God did not withhold his love and forgiveness from us. Because we really are the, truly the least in the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, if we belong to God, we have been radically transformed by him. And we have been radically rescued from the greatest curse and we have been empowered to live radically different than the rest of the world, which means following Christ is about living this radical love where we seek to value and to serve and to build up and to draw closer to even the least deserving among us. This is what it looks like to follow Christ. Let me pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.